Well, ironically, while I say the church should be a desert in the oasis, the very place that we go to lay down our identities, the place where we go to doubt, to show our uncertainty, to show humility, people think of it as the most arrogant place in the world. And you know, for much of the time, it is the most arrogant place in the world. It's where people go who say, I'm hardwired to the truth. I have all the answers. I know what I'm about. It's a place where people go and hold on to their identity and say, I have God in the palm of my hand. I know what God thinks. God's on my side. More often than not, the church seems to be a place where we go simply to affirm, oh, God's there, God loves us, and it'll all work out well in the end. And it's not a place where we can express our doubts and express our uncertainties. In fact, um, an interesting thing I've noticed is, although it's popular today for Christians to say, well, no, doubt is a good thing, doubt is important. What I find is that when you look at the church practice, there's no doubt in the structure itself. So I might say, yes, doubt's a good thing. I, I'm not a completely certain about what I believe and I'm open to listening to other people. But when you go into the church, all of the songs are Jesus is my boyfriend. You know, all of the sermons are God is on our side. All of the prayers are about God's definitely looking out for us. Now, what I would love to see is a church which has doubt, complexity, ambiguity, anger and lament, and joy and faithfulness expressed in all areas of its life, expressed in its music, expressed in the prayers, expressed in the sermons, to show that actually this is a good thing. Now, the reason why this happens, that people say they doubt, and yet the structure believes in their behalf, is because we actually allow something to believe on our behalf. Now, there's a story about um, a guy who thinks he's seed on the ground. He literally thinks he's, a, he's some seed. And he goes to a psychoanalyst, and he goes to an analyst for five years, and eventually the analyst convinces him that he's a human being, that he's not seed on the ground. So he's very happy and he goes away. But six months later, he's back at the analyst's door. He's knocking on the door. And the analyst opens the door. The guy is very upset, hasn't slept for weeks. And he goes, what's wrong? And the guy says, well, my next door neighbors have got chickens. So I'm terrified they're going to eat me. And the guy says, well, what do you mean? He says, you know you're a human being. You know you're not seed on the ground. And he says, I know that, but do the chickens know? Right, now, the point being, I know that fashion's shallow. I know that having a bigger car isn't good for my soul. I know that having a bigger house won't make me happy. The point is, when I go away from the conversation where I say that, I act as if fashion's important. I act as if having a nicer car, car will make me happy. I act as if having a bigger home will fulfill my life. And why? I don't believe it. The advertisers believe it. They believe on my behalf. The structure, the society believes it so that I don't have to do it. And so I actually participate in a system that I don't even believe in. So I can sit in Starbucks and I can say things about big corporations and how bad they are. Starbucks doesn't mind if I don't like it. What it wants is me to buy the cup of coffee, you know? Um, so for me, the church, has to, I, I can say I doubt because the church believes for me. That's why a minister, if a minister says that they're doubting, if a pastor says to the congregation, you know, sometimes I'm not sure if God's there, or I'm not sure what I'm doing, I think I want to go off and, you know, set up a tattoo parlor or something, the, the congregation get terrified. Why? Because the minister is holding their beliefs. And as soon as the minister doubts, whoa, they're confronted with their own doubt. And they're terrified of it because it's a security blanket. They're holding on. A child walks into a room full of people carrying a security blanket. The child knows they're in a room full of people, but as long as they have the blanket, they don't experience the trauma. You take the blanket away, they experience the trauma. In the same way, people in church say they doubt, but the security blanket is the pastor. You take away them, and the pastor doubts, they experience the trauma. But we have to experience the trauma, because Christ didn't just doubt intellectually. Christ experienced the trauma of doubt. If we want to go through the cross, we have to experience the trauma of the cross. We don't watch it like we watch a horror film, where we have a false sense of fear, but we know we're safe. You know, where we're distanced from the horror. We need to participate in the trauma of doubt and uncertainty, so as we die and so as we can be reborn.